If we don't get more, oh, I'm on, okay. <laughs> I was about to scream a lot more loudly. I uh, think I can go out there and maybe pull some more people in, I don't know. <laughs> Say we're gonna give away free coffee or something. Yeah. So, I'm on standby still, yes, or? Okay, so I guess we're starting officially now. Well, thank you uh, for everyone coming. Uh, I guess it's kind of a late session. It's been an already uh, a packed conference, so I'm glad that you stayed late with us uh, to talk about the, tr the cloud-enabled DBA of the 21st century. So while I think that this uh, you know, might be a slight exaggeration of what you're gonna be when you use Trove, I hope I'll convince you that it's not too much of an exaggeration. Um, oh, and I forgot to introduce myself for those who speak Japanese here, watashi no namai. Uh, Alex Tomiku desu. Uh, uh, so, I'm Korean. I, you're Korean, okay, so we don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> but we were in Japan, so I hope someone understood what I said. If not, just ignore it. Uh, all I said was my name is Alex Tomic. I work with Tesora, uh, who's the number one trove company. And I just apologize that I could not deliver the presentation in Japanese, but that's my, the limit of my Japanese knowledge. So, you know, I'm just going to overview uh, what we're going to talk about today. So I'll just do a little kind of summary of how we got to where we are in the uh, database world today, you know, talking about the good old days, uh, a little bit about DBAs, uh, the people who are actually maintaining these systems, and some of the challenges and um, the challenges they face and how Trove and Database as a Service will hopefully uh, meet those challenges. Uh, so just to get to know each other a little bit better, we're not a huge group, so we can make this a little bit more intimate. Um, so of the people who are here, who uh, are you maintaining uh, databases in the cloud? Are you, uh, do you consider yourselves DBAs? Or you have a passive interest? Uh, so who would consider themselves a DBA or has that role? No one? Okay. Uh, are you administering databases in the cloud already? Anyone? Okay. Well, we're giving away uh, OpenStack Trove books. So they're here. One of the authors is here. He's a very smart guy, you know. So uh, if you're interested in the book, we're going to pass around this uh, hat. You can just put a business card in it, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do a raffle and give away the books to whoever's interested in them. OK. So yeah, so they're going to pass around. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about the, the good old days. So, you know, this was uh, you know, a time when things were a lot simpler. Uh, so you had a relational database maybe from one vendor and you use that system for everything. And maybe in a relatively um, modest sized organization you had maybe three database servers running on some very uh, arcane Unix system like AIX or something like that. You had a dev system, maybe a QA system, and a production system. And you could get away with telling your users that there would be downtime, and you would survive the conversation. So this was a much simpler time, a much easier time to be a DBA, I would argue. But you know, as, as we've seen, this, this was kind of an untenable situation. So you had uh, a lot of times where the DBA had to say no to a lot of things. So you'd have to say, no, we can't ship that software today because we have to plan downtime to do a change of the schema. To say, no, we can't scale to anywhere near 50,000 transactions per second on that machine. And we can't run that query in less than an hour. And so no became a kind of answer that had to be given to a lot of questions of the DBAs. And so this resulted, it resulted in what I kind of jokingly refer to as the NoSQL kind of revolution. So I think, you know, the term NoSQL, as it became known later, really tells you everything you need to know about what this meant. It really was a rejection of the difficulty of using relational databases. Um, and so I think this was really a result of Web 2.0, social media that just generated just torrents and massive volumes of data that had to be stored. But the relational databases of the time simply couldn't handle this. And so this kind of one-size-fits-all approach was just not, not practical. So the, the pressure on the flexibility and scalability you know, proved to be too much. 
So, you know, from the perspective of scalability, we had uh, systems that came out of industrial research like Bigtable and um, uh, Dynamo from Amazon. And I know we're not supposed to speak the word Amazon at this conference, but I'll just, you know, uh, that sort of did some very, very kind of uh, revolutionary things for the time. So they said, and there's a great example in the Amazon paper, uh, if you read the original one, where they said, if we have, um, you know, like a shopping cart for our users, and if that shopping cart has maybe some slight inconsistency at one point in the, the cycle of purchasing something, it might not be a really big deal if that consistency is eventually resolved and handled by the application. So this is far preferable to simply not being able to handle the load. So this trade-off uh, upset a lot of people, but eventually it came to be accepted, and now it's uh, just one of the sort of variety of systems that we have uh, at our disposal. And also these systems, because they were published uh, as research papers, then ended up uh, producing uh, open source versions like HBase and Cassandra, which we now know and love. Uh, flexibility, so this was the other big problem. So anyone that has had to uh, manage you know, large infrastructures of let's say even MySQL databases as recently as five, five or six years ago, you knew that uh, DDL management is a real pain. So if you had 300 50 servers that were replicated in five different sort of ways with tables that were very large, having these tables simply handle a simple uh, addition of a column was far, far from being trivial. So when you use a system like CouchDB, MongoDB, if you want to add a column, you just add it and that's it. There's no uh, you know, discussion with uh, you know, the operators to decide when you're going to have downtime and all this sort of stuff. So. This was very compelling to people building applications that didn't want to be subject to those constraints. And then while all of this was happening in the NoSQL world, uh, you know, there's obviously OpenStack and cloud computing and virtualization as, as, as a whole. So I mean, we're at an OpenStack conference. I'm not going to try to sell you on the virtue of cloud computing because I think we all uh, appreciate that. I just I grabbed this diagram because I, I like, you know, the way that this has been sort of shown, which is. You know, OpenStack just introduced this big, chunky layer in between your application and the hardware that you're running that wasn't there before. And this gives us a lot of great benefits, but it also complicates things a lot. So we're, we're going to see that a little bit later in the presentation. Okay. So this presentation was not supposed to be just about technology, but about actually the DBAs, the people sort of maintaining and, and using the databases or uh, administering the databases. So let's actually talk a little bit about them. So you know, I just sort of put these sort of general areas of responsibility. Uh, so this covers things like operations, uh, risk management, data security and availability, uh, development guidance. So you know, if you were having to maintain relational databases, you might have to talk with your developers to go through uh, the schema changes that they uh, suggested, lecture them on the fact that it doesn't sort of uh, meet their normal form, re you know, iterate, so on forth, so forth. Communications. And ad hoc reporting, so of course no one wants to admit that this always happens and DBAs always get sucked into doing ad hoc reporting, so that's why it's crossed off, so we don't want to actually discuss that that happens, but of course it's always happening. Um, in terms of the, the you know, who, who is a DBA interacting with in the organization? So as with the responsibilities, as the responsibilities would suggest, sysadmins, operations people, developers, uh, security teams, and maybe uh, data-centric analysts in the organization. And finally, about the technical expertise that DBA has, pretty much everything down from the data access layer to the hardware itself, and everything in between, ideally. Okay, so 21st century problems. So, you know, what, what are some of the challenges that DBAs have today? And, I mean, a lot of these are post, you know, post-date the 21st century, the beginning, but, you know, it just sounds better 21st century as opposed to 2015 problems. So I think I, I decided on six, and we're going to go through each of these, um, ranging from what I consider the big Vs of big data uh, to, you know, some uh, constraints or some challenges with agility, uh, complex environments, standardization and tooling, security, and generally dealing with upper management. So that would be the final one. So just a brief sort of uh, digression to something that I think is very interesting and worth remembering is this very interesting uh, phenomenon that was uh, 
sort of observed during the first industrial revolution, which was Jevons' paradox. And this noted that, or uh, Jevin, that was his last name or his first name. So he noted that the increase of efficiency of the use of coal actually led to the increase of the use of coal. So this seems paradoxical until you think about the fact that, you know, when, when something becomes more efficient, it becomes cheaper, we find more creative ways of using it. So I think that we can all say, we can all agree that this is something that has happened with uh, storage capacity and computing power. So as this has become more efficient, we've hardly uh, had any lack of interesting ideas for how we can make use of that more uh, inexpensive power. So unfortunately, I'm doing a trove talk. I really didn't want to use the word big data, but I have to use it. So I think we'll just kind of go through uh, this a little bit. I think when, when you, d you discuss big data, or when you talk about the volumes of data that are being generated um, in systems that have to be maintained today, ultimately it comes back to this uh, sort of nice way of formulating the relationship between wisdom and data. So as a DBA, your responsibility is to safeguard this basis of this pyramid, which provides you the information that gives you the knowledge, that gives you the wisdom to make uh, wise decisions. And then this follows generally sort of the, you know, almost the hierarchy of the particular organization. So the DBA is responsible for the data. You provide the information pro pro probably to the business teams. Eventually they use that knowledge and then the CEO hopefully is a wise guy and makes, you know, not a wise guy, but a wise guy. <laughs> Sorry, wise guy, that's a different thing. Um, makes good decisions with, uh, with that information. So unfortunately, and now I'm gonna sort of reveal a little bit of my bias and maybe against some of the tendencies of big data. I think the uh, flip side of that pyramid is the sort of inverse, which is you know noise leading to errors, which lead to mistakes, which lead to just general chaos. Uh, but hopefully, you know that's a little digression. Okay, so I'm going to talk about something quite abstract, and I hope uh, you'll find this interesting, because I think that when people talk about the four V's of big data, they are, and I hope I'm not going to forget them. Uh, volume, which is fairly obvious, just the general volume of data that you're generating. Um, uh, velocity, so it's being generated more rapidly, more of it, more quickly. Uh, veracity, meaning is this data actually correct? Is this useful is this, or is it just noise? And the last one, I'm missing volume, veracity. Sorry, now I'm going to go back. Variety, I knew I would forget that one. Variety, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was talking about the, the, four, the four Vs. So variety, meaning that there's a lot of different types of data that are coming in. But I think that an underappreciated V in this discussion is value. So how important, how useful is this information? And so I, I, I drew this graph, and I hope you'll, you'll kind of find this interesting, that I think if you look at, let's say, the volume of data that's being generated, and let's say we're just looking at this view of data over the course of a day and the amount of data that could theoretically be stored if you wanted to store it. And the relationship that with that compared to the actual value or importance of that data. And this seems very abstract, so let's just think of some examples. So let's say, you know, a row in your customer table. If you're, let's say, a, you know, a medium to large size enterprise, maybe you could have as few as, you know, several thousand or maybe, you know, on the order of 100,000 rows in that table. And if you have, let's say, um, you know, people who are managing those relationships with those customers, if just one of those roles just vanished from your database, they're going to notice it. So that's kind of a bad thing. So the types of systems that you're using for this sort of data are going to be your very robust systems like Oracle that provide you strong consistency guarantees, durability, all that sort of stuff. But then as you go further out on this sort of long tail, then you might get to something like, let's say, you know, a log entry for someone who visited your website on some day with all of the data that goes along with that, like let's say the user agent, uh, you know, the geography, all that sort of stuff. And then we can go to the point of ridiculousness and perhaps there's some Internet of Things startup somewhere, you know, in Silicon Valley, some bright-eyed guys who have some cool sensors that are going to grab all of the data of all of the individual electrons for when you touch a, an object and how much start uh, discharge that generates. And then maybe they collect all that data and then infer some interesting things about, you know, the level of stress of your employees, something like that. I mean, I think we can agree that that's a pretty absurd thing, but in theory, that data could be stored if we wanted to. And the individual importance of each piece of data exponentially goes down. 
And this gets more complicated because it's not just that we generate a lot of this data, we also have the fact that uh, data can be summarized or it can, be, it can evolve, it can be derived from other pieces of data. So maybe that log entry wasn't very valuable and maybe you're, oops, maybe you're, uh, ah, it doesn't work, I can't actually show you the, the pointer thing. Well, okay, so, you know, this piece of data, maybe this is just gonna go through your stream processing system now. So maybe this never actually sits anywhere in a database on a disk, but it goes through your stream processing system and it ends up in a summary. And that system might be in a MySQL database that's used by your analytics teams, or maybe it's used by an application that provides you a dashboard or some sort, something of that sort. And I think this sort of illustrates the difference between, you know, the typical big data sort of systems that are managed by Sahara and the stuff that's further to the left of this curve, which is the, the, the sweet spot for Trove, so more relational database kind of things. Okay, so I promise I have only one more kind of technical or abstract kind of slide and then we're gonna get to some more practical things. So in the end, I think like the challenge for a DBA is really kind of an optimization problem. So it's, it's, it's your goal, in my view, to minimize the economic cost and maximize the value, whatever that value might be. It's a sort of, it can be kind of difficult to define that given a bunch of different constraints, like let's say the throughput of the system you need to provide latency, retention time, your tolerance for data loss, and complexity. So, okay, so to put this a little bit less abstractly, uh, you know, your users will have a tendency to say yes to everything. So if you ask, I mean, to give a kind of an absurd example, let's say you ask your users, well, do you need the, you know, the, the response time on this service uh, to be, let's say, less than a millisecond? And they'll say, well, yeah, of course, you know, users tend to like things that are fast. Of course, it can be less than a millisecond. And then you go and you say, okay, well, I'm going to think, I think I can build the, you know, an FPGA uh, programmable uh, grid array. I'll rewrite Redis in hardware. It'll take me six months and maybe you'll have a prototype version. Then your user will go, oh, okay, no, I don't need that because uh, I don't want to pay for that. And so this is, you know, that's one sort of kind of absurd extreme. On the other extreme, as a DBA, you will always want to over-provision everything because it reduces your risk, it makes your life easier, and if you're not paying for it, it doesn't really matter to you, right? So, you know, the, a balance between those two extremes has to always be uh, found. Uh, so some other examples of this, this sort of trade-off game might be, you know, let's say, you know, if you double the retention time of the data in some of your, uh, let's say, your analytics systems, it doubles the cost. Can you justify that doubling of the cost? Is it twice as valuable that your users have access to twice as much data? Uh, maybe in some cases data loss is acceptable. It sounds kind of heretical for me to say that, but maybe it doesn't matter. So maybe those, let's say, to, to stick with that example of the analytic systems, maybe it doesn't really matter if that system crashes. Your users will tolerate that. They'll allow you to have the time to rebuild the system. And in that case, you can use a much more uh, you, you have maybe some gains in efficiency as a result. And the other final thing is increased complexity. So if all is equal, you can do something better with something like Redis, but then you don't want to have the complexity of maintaining another database system, you might say, okay, we'll go with a MySQL system because we just don't want to deal with the complexity. And so that complexity gets us to the problem of heterogeneous environments. So this whole NoSQL revolution really was the end of the one-size-fits-all era. So it means that now we have a whole bunch of different systems for a whole bunch of different purposes. And obviously it's difficult to develop expertise in seven different systems that are architected very differently for seven different purposes. So another problem uh, that has to be dealt with is homegrown tooling. So, you know, your, your first day as a DBA, you come in, your boss takes you out for beers, everything is great. Then you get back to the office and you, you know, you read the employee manual and everything is fine. Then on D2, you go and you check out the DB scripts uh, repository and you find this. And you smash the keyboard and you wonder what you just got yourself into. I hope this is, people understand this. And, you know, I'm wondering if, if any, <laughs> it looks like a typo. Yeah, yeah, someone just, <laughs> <you know. laughs> okay. So increased demands on agility. So a wise person once told me that agile seems to have devolved in the current environment into just 
more stuff more quickly. Uh, as much as you know, the agile development philosophy had some interesting ideas, I think that's really what it means to a lot of people now, and ideally on demand. So I mean, one, one of the problems that this has is, is something that was referred to, I think, uh, quite nicely in the Bitnami uh, keynote on uh, Tuesday, which is the fact that if you don't meet the demands of your users, they will find ways to solve that problem on their own. And so as a result, you have this kind of proliferation, or you may have this proliferation of quasi-production systems. And I say quasi-production because any system that people expect to be up and have become used to, if it goes away and they're upset, it's effectively a production system. And so just like this, you know, this sheep who is really happy to be away from the flock and thinks it's all cool to be on this road and on his own, when the first problem, the, you know, the first disaster strikes, one of those quasi-production systems that your rogue development team put into place because they don't have proper backups, uh, they didn't really know what they were doing, when something goes wrong, you as the wise DBA will have to sort of bring that sheep back into the fold. And this is something that you will eventually have to deal with. So, you know, the, the more that you meet this demand of agility, the, the, the easier life is going to be. And another problem that I think a lot of DBAs face, and this is really more of a communications problem, not a technical problem, is really what I think of as the curse of the security team. So the security team has this problem, you know, if, if you do your job too well, you appear to be not busy, and someone at some point will notice how much you're getting paid. And they'll be like, you know, well, uh, this guy doesn't seem to be too busy, but then the problem is that you're doing your job well, and things are running well for a good reason. Uh, on the flip side, if you don't do your job, you're stressed out fixing corrupted data and all sorts of different problems, and no one's happy with you. So it, it's kind of a no-win situation, but fundamentally it's a communications issue, not a technical one, to educate the people that you work with on the value of the things that you're doing. I see some people laughing, so I'm not sure if others have kind of observed this, but I think it's a, it's, it's a difficult problem to solve. It's quite generic. Yeah, I would say that too. Maybe it's not just the security team. Okay, and I think probably, you know, if all of that stuff wasn't bad enough, I think the security and regulatory environment has become uh, challenging, to say the least. Uh, and I think this is in large part because of the fact that it's just easy to have more international firms these days. So even a startup with as few as 40 people could have three or four different offices in three or four different continents, subject to three or four different uh, regulatory uh, environments. Uh, and a great example of that is this EU's uh, US uh, Safe Harbor Act. Uh, so this was legislation that was put in place for uh, companies that want to ensure that they are compliant with both uh, regulatory frameworks. Uh, as recently as uh, this month, this has been declared invalid due to uh, a number of reasons that I'm not you know, qualified to talk about because I'm not a lawyer. But I think that there are some interesting and disturbing precedents that people need to be sort of uh, to take into account when they do their risk assessments. So a great example of that was uh, uh, a case last year. There's an article, I have a link in the presentation, where Microsoft w was compelled to release data stored on a server that was physically located in Dublin by virtue of the fact that they were an American firm. So if you are a company that is responsible for uh, cat pictures on the internet, Maybe this is not something that concerns you very much, but for a certain sensitive sector, this might be not a non-trivial thing to consider. So, and because legal frameworks move slowly, they're behind the technical reality. And another interesting side effect of this is that there are companies that now are trying to sort of capitalize on this. So I'm not, uh, I'm not sort of advocating for this particular company, but I think it's interesting that there's a company actually called Safe Swiss Cloud that is now trying to move into uh, are trying to capitalize on this um, reality that people are uncertain about what's going to happen with their data. So they're saying, well, you know, we're a Swiss cloud provider. We will make sure that your data is safe in some respect. And whether you trust that or not is another issue, but they, the, the reality that they're offering that as part of their value proposition, I think, is interesting. Okay, and finally about uh, security. So, I mean, I think this is something that's not really discussed enough in the cloud computing <laughs> world, and I think it really should be, is the fact that data breaches are a very, very, very serious problem. Um, so since 2009, there's a publicly available data set, which I have as a link in the presentation, which I'll make available later, uh, that there were 177 major data breaches 
that are known about because they were released in some uh, newspaper or article or some sort. Uh, I created a nice pivot table, which is just sort of disturbingly fascinating, you know, to go through just how much data has been leaked. So, you know, I, in my little summary, I found that there were up to almost two trillion records that have been lost in the last uh, six years as a result of all of these breaches. And 64 of these are what I would consider serious or potentially catastrophic because they are leaks of credit cards, bank records, health records. Uh, I think many organizations would have trouble recovering from a breach of this scale. And as bad as this is, keep in mind that this is just what we know about because it's in the public record. There are probably many, many more where a ransom was offered and it was paid and no one ever knew anything about it. Okay, so this all seems kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff and now how is Trove gonna help with all of this stuff? Because okay. in the end we're all, we all wanna be data man, we wanna be a superhero, we wanna deal with all of these problems. Well, I think the first thing to, to discuss is that Trove uh, database as a service is a full database lifecycle management system. So it's, it's much more than just, you know, using Nova to create an instance and then, you know, installing MySQL. So, you know, among the burdens, among the things that Sorov will help with is administrative burden. So you want to provision a database, you just do Trove create, and you choose which data store you want, and now you have a database. So that's fairly easy. Security, Trove, user grant access. So you can create a user with just one command or you can create a user with one command, grant access with another command. Uh, backup and restore, similarly. Trove backup create, instance that you wanna create the backup for. Replication configuration. So this is where things get far you know, less simple when you think about the ways that different data databases handle replication. With Trove, it's simply Trove create the instance and you specify which uh, database you want or which uh, instance you want to create as the, the or which uh, master you want to be uh, for this slave. Can you finish those short questions? Short questions? Yeah. Oh. Question. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, there are many. I I'll go through some of them. So there's... Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, and another example, cluster provisioning. So if you want to uh, provision a Mongo cluster, so there's Mongo support, um, it's a simple command. Okay, so this challenge of man managing uh, heter uh, heterogeneous environments. So now a pop quiz, I'm sorry, I have to stress you guys. So the syntax to grant access to a user in MySQL, does anyone know what it is? It's some grant, so I couldn't type it out actually if you asked me, I think it's grant. User but it's the, the actual grant, the, the operation on, yeah, okay, right, okay, good, so we know from MySQL. Will it work if you make a typo? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's from MySQL. Okay, what about Postgres? It's similar. It's similar, right, because I think grant is a SQL standard command for granting access, okay, so Postgres, fine. Aha, what about Mongo? I'll say I have no idea. Actually, I should know. I'm not going to admit that, but I think <laughs> it's probably, I mean, I could look it up, right? Oracle. It's okay. We're not grading the test. It's just sort of <laughs> DB2. So I think I've, I hope I've made the point, right? So this is not rocket science. You can easily look this up in the documentation, but now it's easy. You know, with Trove, you just do user grant access, instance user, and the database, and it's as simple as that. Okay, so the Agile DBA, I'm sorry, I should have used that maybe as the title of the, of the presentation because, you know, Agile is just a generally a good thing. Um, <laughs> so let's say configuration profiles. So this is one very, very powerful feature of Trove, and it relates to the discussion that we had earlier about how you can optimize uh, your system. So for example, you could create a configuration profile that you call unsafe high performance. And then with this, you specify, let's say, fsync equals off. So for those that aren't technical, uh, f -sync is just where you say that the, the, the rights to disk are not, uh, would not be preserved if the system crashes. This can give you really great uh, benefits in terms of performance, but it's unsafe. But in some cases, this might be a much more efficient way of, of running your systems. Oh yeah, and then 
to apply that, so let's say, to your data mart. If we have this example of the data marts that your analytics users are using, you just apply that with configuration apply. And all of that under the covers is handled for you. Uh, another interesting example could be, let's say, creating data sets for development purposes. So security is a, you know, a serious concern. Even insiders can be a, you know, potential uh, vulnerability points. So it makes a lot of sense to create data sets that developers um, that are, that, you know, strip out uh, sensitive data for your developers. So this is fairly straightforward. So, you know, create, create a backup from your production system. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we'll do a draw, but I think you seem interested, so maybe we should just go into you. Uh, so, you know, you do a backup of your production system. Now you take that backup, you create another system based on that backup that you call dev cleanse. You go in, maybe do uh, update customer, set some particular sort of uh, attributes, set to some random thing. And then you make that backup available to your developers. So now even if they have this, and even if they do decide that they want to try to sell this to some guys on the uh, dark web or whatever, it's not going to have anything that's uh, of any use to them. Okay, so maintenance burden. I think this is uh, one area where a lot of uh, DBAs that have been you know, around for a long time in a particular organization might be kind of reluctant to you know, bring on something like Trove because they may see that, you know, well, I'm the only one that knows how to manage these 772 scripts, and if we, you know, move all this stuff off, you know, into Trove, it might, you know, may not be good, so good for me. But I think, I, I hope that I've made the case based on all the challenges and all the things that we have to handle as DBAs that that's actually something that's going to benefit you as opposed to uh, hindering you. So, you know, you can reduce complexity, increase productivity by, uh, you know, eliminating a lot of this stuff, which is very difficult to maintain. And then on the, the you know, the security note, uh, and I think this is more of an argument just for OpenStack in general, not just Trove, is the fact that, you know, you, you might not be willing, allowed for regulatory reasons, or even aware that when you go with a big public, uh, public cloud provider, you're effectively outsourcing your security to that public cloud. And this, if you read uh, some, uh, Bruce Schneier has written some interesting stuff about this. He terms this uh, feudal security, effectively. So by giving all of your data to a public cloud, you're effectively allowing them to own that data. And they, in turn, provide you security. And again, for that sort of cat provider, uh, provider of cat pictures, uh, maybe that's a perfectly reasonable sort of trade-off. Uh, as an example, this presentation is on Google. I'll make it available on Google because I'm not really that worried if Google has access to this. But for sensitive sectors, this might not be such a trivial uh, decision. So OpenStack and Trove give you the freedom to choose whether you want public, hybrid, or private. And so on, okay, so I'm going to ask something a little bit uh, potentially controversial, but this is uh, uh, talking about security. So I want to see who would agree or disagree with this statement when it comes to um, you know, securing your data, as we've seen as something important. So can you defend your servers, or is it a, is it a futile exercise? So I'll frame, okay, so I mean, the next slide, I hope I'll try to kind of uh, address this. Because I think with, uh, with uh, last year when the, the, the Heartbleed bug was revealed, I, I hope that this sort of dispelled once and for all the fact that as, mu as hard as you will try to secure all of your servers, eventually, there will always be zero day vulnerabilities, there will be problems, and it's really just a matter of time before something will happen, right? So rather than just waiting around, I think one interesting example of something that you can do with Trove tomorrow if you were to install it, is to create a honeypot in, simple, in four simple lines. So I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the idea of a honeypot. It's effectively a trap. So you create deliberately a system where you want hackers to try to, to, to connect to it because they, it reveals something about where they got access to the information to get uh, to your database. So now with Trove, you can do this in four lines. So you create a tasty instance with some really small instance type. You know, create a database on it. Create a user. We'll call it Canary, because I'm not sure if you're familiar with the idea of the Canary. It was used in the coal mines uh, because they were much more sensitive to the fumes that would result from uh, uh, I don't even know what they actually did, but the canary would drop, and then you would know that you had to get out of the mine. 
and then you grant access on that instance to uh, your Canary user. And then just pray that no one ever actually touches it. <laughs> and then in Mitaka, we don't have this yet, but so in, a, in that an interesting way, with two more commands to see if anyone actually fell into your honeypot, you know, you enable general logging, save that log from time to time, see what happened, and then just hope that your file is empty. But I would argue that at least knowing that, that file, if that file were not to be empty and you really have a, a, a problem is better than not knowing at all and then waiting to find out in the newspaper when you wake up in the morning that you've <laughs> leaked a lot of your data. So I think, um, you know, just to summarize, uh, you know, what's the, the path forward for DBAs in this sort of cloud-enabled world? Uh, you know, I think I, I would hope it would be obvious that Trove doesn't understand your data, doesn't understand your applications or your users. Uh, this is still your job as a DBA, obviously. And I think that this allows you to move up the application value stack. So, for example, if a DBA was exclusively responsible for ensuring that data was um, available on the systems, now, let's say with the honeypot example, you can become more valuable to the security team by saying, hey, I have an interesting way of uh, you know, determining if we've been uh, compromised. And also remember Jevons' paradox, because I think it also applies with the efficiency of services. So you know, the easier things become, the more uh, creative ways we find of using those uh, services. And on, on, on you know, the other extreme is uh, specialization. So uh, database performance tuning you know, for um, complex environments was already a very, very difficult problem. And you know, understanding all the implications of how that database uses the hardware, CPUs, storage, all that stuff was difficult before the cloud. And keep in mind that all the DB database architectures that we are using, that we support in Trove today, were developed pre-cloud. So MongoDB predates the cloud for the most part. All of these systems were designed pre-cloud. And so adding in this complexity of virtualized CPUs, virtualized storage, virtualized networking is going to make performance tuning and uh, optimization even more challenging. So I think that there will be no lack of uh, no shortage of uh, requirement for people who understand how all this stuff works. And I just want to sort of acknowledge, uh, so Jordan uh, Oringer of Zeppelin was originally slated to help out with this presentation, but he wasn't able to be here as a result of a scheduling conflict, so I just want to acknowledge that. And thank you for your attention. So are there any, yeah, are there any questions? I had a microphone, I don't know. Does anyone have any questions? Anyone? Well, is any so? My question was regarding performance optimization on mm -hmm. the last slide touched it a bit. Mm -hmm. so as today's date, uh, we have production workloads mm -hmm. in conventional databases mm -hmm. which are working on bare metal. Okay. To what extent probe system would be ready? Like in a <laughs> open stack cloud, say the right activities to that is, is going through many layers, introducing latencies. Mm -hmm. And great deal of effort is put on the by DBAs or the architects to for the performance optimizations. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, it's it, the, the classic computer science answer is it depends. Um, so I think, I mean, it, it's... Are there uh, production load uh, implementations of Trove at this moment? Uh, yeah, so Pro Trove is being run in production in a number of scenarios, but I think it's, so one thing that's important to remember, and maybe I didn't uh, touch on this enough, is that Trove is effectively managing the system. But, so once the database ends up on your, it's, it's effectively a Nova instance. If that Nova instance doesn't perform, Trove can't do anything about that. So it's really a matter of, let's say, how well is the, the underlying KVM or the underlying virtualization layer? How well is it doing its job? Uh, the underlying hardware that you're dealing with, I, I think it's just a general performance problem uh, of Nova, you Usually could say. in case of databases, uh, people like to extract the last ounce of efficiency. Yeah, of course. Uh, and that's why I think that this just gets more complicated with the cloud. So I think, you know, a lot of people are focused on, you know, making things easier. That's one of the big sort of selling points of the cloud. But I think a very big risk factor is performance. Um, and this is just a, con this is something I can't answer in a simple way, obviously. Because uh, it depends on so many different factors. But Does Trove handle containers if say, databases are run inside containers? The virtualization overhead is Ooh. less. 
Yeah, I think we have some kind of research, some work that's being done on that, but it's not. Yeah. I mean, I think from, I mean, at least the, the work that I've done, KVM, for example, is, performs quite well, I'd say, in, you know, compared to bare metal. It's obviously not the same as containers. So I think this is the kind of thing where, you know, your mileage may, may vary. I mean, every environment could be different. And I think just it's just a matter of collecting data, uh, experimenting. Yeah, and I, th I think it's a valid concern. But I, unfortunately, I don't have you know any raw data that I can present to you at the moment. But uh, I think it, it it depends on the particular uh, installation of the stack. Uh, any other questions? Anything else? Okay, so it's six o'clock. I think we all want to go and attend some of the interesting parties and stuff. Yeah. So who wants a trove book? Yeah. We were going to do a draw, but I didn't get enough business cards. So I don't know. Whoever, if any, I mean, we could probably get one more. I mean, they come, to the booth. They come to our booth tomorrow, we give you a book. Do I have to get this back? No, you can keep it. I got five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So who wants a trove book? Anyone? First yeah. five people get a trove book. I've got one already. Yeah, oh, here you go. No problem. Everyone gets a book. <laughs> Anyone, sir, would you like a book here? presentation yeah thank you thank you for coming